But tonight, we're here to uh, take a, a journey uh, around the planet with uh, Craig Childs. He's speaking on a new book project he has in the works, exciting, where he's uh, on the trail of the first people to uh, the uh, people who entered North America and other landscapes at the end of the last ice age. He's been traveling around to look at those sites. He's been having encounters with uh, um, paleontologists, uh, story scientists, storytellers, and uh, I'm very excited to see what he's going to share with us tonight. I'm a huge fan of his most recent book, Apocalyptic Planet, a field guide to the ever-ending Earth, in which he, he interweaves natural history, social commentary, and climate science, and literary references, uh, all uh, cast in, in his outrageous wild adventures. Uh, he's after glimpses of the ever-present apocalypse to remind us that the earth is a, is a tumultuous place to live and to imagine that um, that there's going to be one apocalypse uh, is probably not a very good model to go on so uh, it's it's a it's a fantastic uh, account of uh, this raucous planet we live in he he traveled uh, to see melting glaciers in Patagonia he kayaked a very an impossibly steep river in Tibet he visited the edge of rising sea levels in Alaska. And when he wanted to visit someplace that represented a genetic wasteland of extreme biotic sterility, where do you suppose he went? <laughs> he spent three days camping and walking in an Iowa cornfield. I tell you, the man is fearless. It's a hilarious and harrowing account, and that's, there's a chapter on that in Apocalyptic Planet also. So he, he will go where the story is. He's a regular commentator on NPR's Morning Edition. He's got a cool piece coming up with Radiolab. Um, his work has appeared in the uh, New York Times everywhere. And uh, his books uh, include, and I saw some people bring them in tonight, The Secret Knowledge of Water, Discovering the es Essence of the American Desert, Finders Keepers, A Tale of Archaeological Plunder and Obsession, and The Animal Dialogues, Uncommon Encounters in the Wild, Wonderful Books, All. So please help me welcome Craig Schott. Hi, everybody. Happy. May 1st, Beltane, right? So what happens on Beltane? <laughs> what do we do? I think we, we dance naked by the river. Yeah, we did that earlier. <laughs> so later, <laughs> we'll figure something else out. <laughs> um, and I just have this image up because it's hot here. And, and I want to offer some, some relief. I, I, just, I just came from Colorado. The, uh, I uh, just, just flew in today, and uh, it's, it's cooler, and that's what we're all talking about. I'm going, oh, it's cold in Colorado. It's, almost, it's frosty, and, and here it's very hot. And uh, so I thought you might need uh, something really cold to look at, just uh, as a placeholder, because we're, gonna, we're going into the Ice Age, and, uh, and my mind has been entirely in the Ice Age for, for a while now, for... For a couple of years, uh, I've been working very intensely on this on this project of following the first people into North America, different points of entry, and and uh, where the continent was crossed, how to get across the the Southern Rockies in the Ice Age. Uh, you know, just just I, I'm going to the landscape to to see what it's like to to get there and say, okay, there were there were people here ten thousand years ago, fifteen thousand, twenty thousand. What is it like? I I I feel like if, if I need to find the the answer to a question or I need to understand a, how a story works, I need to go there in person. I need to I need to touch it. I need to smell it. I need to taste it. It's you understand something different about landscape and about the history of a landscape when you're there. You understand something different about time. I, I was uh, recently observing the, the construction of an enormous clock. Uh, 
it, it's, it's in a warehouse in San Rafael, California, right next to the freeway, an awful place. And, uh, and you go in and, and they're, they're building this, this clock that, that is, it's designed to run for 10,000 years. And, and there are these, the, the gears are, some of them are 15 feet across and it's, it's multiple stories tall and, and they've got it in pieces and, and little machines are just whirring everywhere, uh, testing the, the strength of the ball bearings and determining how many rotations they can withstand if they can indeed last 10,000 years. This project has been going on for, for a while now and it's, it's almost finished. The, and it was amazing to get in there and, and just take some of these wheels. I don't know if I screwed up everything, but you just, <laughs> you just rotate them and they start turning and then things start spinning all around you. And, and the idea here is they'll take this clock and they'll bury it in a cave in the, in the West Texas desert. And, um, and you'll be able to go into it and, and explore it. And what they... You know, what they want to do is build something that will make us think in time scales beyond our own lives or even beyond the, the short number of generations. I mean, we talk ideally about, you think about seven generations ahead. They're saying, no, actually, you need to think in 10,000-year increments. We're starting to understand time in a different way now, that, that we, are, we are understanding where we are in a larger continuum, how ice ages are moving in and out, and, and what happens to the planet next, because there will be a 10,000 years from now. It will happen. I mean, there was a 10,000 years ago, right? So they're saying, let's not think in seven generations, let's think in, in 10,000 years. Let's put this clock in the ground and, and have it be a place where people can come and just, yeah, I mean, they're, they're they're trying to figure out what kind of signs to use, what language would be spoken, what would be most readily observable to anybody who came to this place 10,000 years from now. Because they're saying, we're not so much worried about right now. We're thinking that people will come here later, much later. And what will they be speaking then? And it's, I mean, you start, if you travel on the landscape, you start to think about time in that way. I mean, you see a building like this and you go, okay, how long is this going to be here? I mean, 50 years, 100, 1,000, 5,000 years? I mean, what is going to be here? It will, that time will come. And so as I'm looking at this clock, I'm thinking about my research on the Ice Age and and for that moment of spinning those gears on the clock, I, I felt like I was in, well, three different worlds at once. I was here in this moment, but I'm also doing research on mammoths and, and, uh, and, and the late Pleistocene, and I'm looking ahead 10,000 years. And, and that's the kind of scope that I think about when I'm walking through canyons, when I'm walking across the desert through sand dunes that have been blowing for two million years. I think about time in this way. And for me to understand time, I need to go there. I need to go to the place. This is uh, the, the Great Lakes um, last February. And, uh, and actually, right now, the Great Lakes are still 35% under ice cover, uh, which, is, which is really unusual. And, and uh, so, of course, I had to go there because it was just dre dreadfully cold. It was, uh, it was awful. I <laughs> I mean, I, I, I enjoyed it thoroughly, but, but I, I, um, I went to the, the shores of Lake Superior. Let me show you where, see if this works. Okay, this right here is, is probably the most frozen part of the lake. And what I was doing was I just took a sled and, uh, and harnessed it with my camp and just went out onto Lake Superior and, and took off to do who knows what. I was looking at a human occupation near the Great Lakes at 12,000 years ago. And I wanted to get a taste of, of the cold to try to write about uh, what would it be. And this may not even end up in the book, but I just wanted to say, what is it like to sleep at, at 25 or 30 below without a tent with just a sleeping bag and a bivy? And, uh, and the coastline was just amazing. Uh, everything, everything was frozen. I, I, you know, I've spent time on, on polar ice sheets and I've, I've never been this cold before in my life, where even the ice was growing ice. Um, and and you, you, along the shoreline, you know, up on the ceiling, I, everything is frozen. The, the springs that are coming out of the rock are, are, are beautifully frozen. Oh, thanks. 
Yeah, that's what it looks like. <laughs> and, and so I'm looking out here, out across Lake Superior, and, and uh, just, just heading out in, in, into the white, into places where you know, pieces of the lake are just sticking up, pieces of ice. And, uh, and this, is my, this is my gear. And uh, I lasted one night. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it was it was fairly chilly, um, and and you it feels like you're skiing across a or you're walking across a uh, uh, a cornfield or something you know something very flat in in the winter. But then every once in a while you're you're reminded that you are on a lake, and at night, oh, you should hear it. It sounds like submarines colliding underneath you, and you're you're sleeping on top of it, or you're you're thinking about sleeping on top of it. You, and, <laughs> And so, uh, and, and everything has to be cooked. Your, your little energy gels that freeze absolutely solid, those, everything freezes. Like eating a, eating a, a, a like a cliff bar at that temperature is a violent experience. <laughs> because you're just breaking off chunks of it. And, and, uh, and so I set my camp out there and the sun setting really is a, a marvelous moment because you're you're committed. Um, <laughs> it it just becomes incredibly cold, and and I put all my water in my bivy bag. This is my camp, and I was going to stay out for three nights. <laughs> um, I had a plan to cross part of the lake, uh, uh, but. I didn't sleep at all that night. Uh, it took me an hour to get out of my bag in the morning because the zipper had frozen solid, and then once I got that open, the, the bivy zipper had frozen, and I thought about just taking my knife and getting out, but I, I, one way or the other, I had a couple more nights. So the next night, I, uh, I did a snow cave, and uh, a, a Quincy, uh, uh, where you just stack up snow and pound it down and then burrow into it. And, and uh, light a candle in there. And this is, you know, I, I, as I was thinking about it, I, 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 I do little video clips sometimes where I'm talking into the camera and I usually throw them all away because they're just terribly embarrassing. But the morning that I finally got out of my bag, I opened, I turned on the camera and I just said, my theories about humans being here in the ice age are all incorrect. They left here in the winter. It sucks, it is awful. <laughs> They would not have stayed. But then, you know, you adapt. You figure it out. You, you, you dig a hole in the snow and you climb into it. And, and whereas the nights had been 20 below in, or 25 below inside the, uh, the shelter, it's, it's 10 below, which, man, you're, you're just unzipping things at 10 below. And, just, and it is, it's wonderful. And you realize how quickly you adapt. And, and I think we look at ourselves sometimes and think, you know, we can't really do that much as humans. We, like sleeping on the, everybody up there was going, my God, you're going out to sleep on the lake? That's insane. And I think, well, you know, I bet if we all did it, it would be normal. <laughs> did I just say that? <laughs> so maybe what I do is, is not normal, but I want to understand what it's like to be out there, to be, you know, you, you put your candle next to your head and you just lie there and watch and you think about all the people on all the thousands of years who have burrowed into the snow and waited it out. You think of the early migrations 40, 45,000 years ago heading out onto the Russian plain where, where the first homo sapiens were, were heading farther into the world than they'd ever been, spreading out into northern latitudes, up into the Arctic. How did they figure it out? What did they do? How did they get to the land bridge? How did people move and why did they move? Why do animals move? Why do we do this? Why do we cover the planet the way we do? As I'm writing this book, part of me is going, yay humans, look at all that we can do. We are just, we are nonstop machines of going and going and going. And then another part of me is going, oh my God, this is, this is terrifying. Why are we so driven to go? What does it mean that people walked across a land bridge and entered North America? So tonight, I want to I 
throw us through. It's going to be a whirlwind of landscapes, and we're just going to have to go and then see what happens when we get there because we've got a lot of places to check out. I'm, I'm following human entrance into North America from 23,000 years ago to 10,000 years ago, looking at the different places people came in, and this is... This is kind of the, this is the going scientific mythology right now. This is the story that, that many of us tell, that, uh, that when the sea levels were 400 feet down, there was the, the Bering Land Bridge right there connecting North America to Asia. And, and since then, 400 feet back up, that land bridge is, is gone. Most of it is underwater. The, the Bering Sea is, is at an average of 100 feet deep, so it's a fairly shallow sea sitting right on top of what used to be land. There are pieces of it remaining. I, I traveled up to uh, St. Lawrence Island, which is, which is off the coast, a little closer to Siberia. It's an Alaskan island, so it's right in between Siberia and Alaska in the, in the Bering Sea. And I just, I, what I really wanted to do there was just stand on it. I just wanted to get on to the Bering Land Bridge and say, this is, here it is, here's the place, here's where it happened. And, and this is what it looks like. It's a, very, it's a lively landscape. Um, it's the, the village here in the background, that is, uh, that's Savunga. It's a Siberian Yupik uh, subsistence village. And uh, an interesting place to drop into. It has no infrastructure for people who drop in. Um, and curiously, I went there with my mother. That's a whole different story. I, <laughs> I, we met outside of the post office one morning, and, and I said, hey, I'm going up to the Bering Sea for a couple weeks. And she said, oh, I really wish I could come. And I said, well, why don't you? You want to come? And she said, yeah. And I said, well, we're going to a village where uh, I don't really know. It's a Yupik Eskimo village. Uh, um, I've made some contacts. I don't know how it's going to work out, where we're going to sleep, or what's going to happen. And she just was going, I don't care. Let's, let's go. <laughs> and that's that human thing, I think. Some of us are just compelled to go. Uh, my mother is a goer. She, she travels. She moves. And I am her son. And I go to this place. And I want to see what it's like. I want to walk out on this treeless island and, and see the Ice Age in front of me. And, and, uh, and in front of the village, there are all these uh, umiaks, these walrus skin boats that are, that are no longer used, but were used within the last 30 years. And, and you walk around and you find... You find you know, you go to a village, a ruined village that's like 2,000 years old, and there, it's just covered with, with this is a, a piece of, of seal rib with a hole drilled in it. And the man I was with out there said, oh, yeah, you'd, you'd hang that by your side and use it to scrape off ice 2,000 years ago. So this is the Bering Land Bridge. When you were, if you were there... Um, uh, it closed off about 10,000 years ago, but if you were there at the height of the Ice Age 23,000 years ago, you would have been 500 miles from the nearest shoreline standing right here. We think of the Bering Land Bridge as this, as this uh, catwalk sometimes, when, when no, it's, it's, this, it's a subcontinent. Um, it's not a way to get from A to B, it is a place to live. The, the, uh, the going theory right now, looking at, at, uh, at genetics and linguistics uh, is that the people settled onto the land bridge for about 15,000 years and stayed there. So this, this notion of, of the, the brave hunters with spears going into the unknown isn't quite the, the right story for the Bering Land Bridge. It was more that people lived there. I mean, 15,000 years. Think about living in one place for 15,000 years. I mean, how long have you lived here? <laughs> There's another time sense that's going on here. And let's just, I'll throw in um, ice from the, the last glacial maximum. There was ice there, ice there. So obviously you're, you're coming across and it's, it's hard to get to the rest of North America. Um, eventually, about 17,000 years ago, that ice started to recede. And, and you can see routes starting, open, starting to open up along the coastline. And, and Eventually, it, did, it receded enough to open up a, a channel into the Americas, but people had already gotten here long before that. There are solid dates that are coming out of all over North America right now at 15,000 years ago and 14,000 years ago. So people have been here for a while. To get here, you had to deal with the ice one way or another. So 
I've got to go out and deal with ice. I've got to, I've got to uh, understand what it's like to cross an ice field. And, and I, uh, uh, last summer, or last spring, early, or mid-May, I don't know, last spring, when was it? It had just snowed 47 inches the week before in South Central Alaska. And we arrived for, a, for I think, a 10-day trek, five of us, heading up into the Harding Ice Field, which is, which is about 1,000 square miles of ice, the last, one of the last largest remaining pieces of ice in, in North America. You climb up out of the valley floor, up into the mountains, looking back down at this, at this lush area, and you're looking ahead into just this oblivion, this wasteland. I remember coming across grizzly tracks on the way up, and the grizzly was going the way we were going. The grizzly was going onto the ice field, and we were just looking at this going, what's the idea here? Like, what are you planning? There's nothing alive out there. This is, this is the end of the world right here. There's nothing else, and yet a grizzly was going there, and, and yet we were going there. I mean, what? <laughs> maybe the grizzly was a wingnut like us. So it's been most of human history that we've been walking at this stride, that we haven't moved with airplanes, we haven't moved uh, with sails, we've been walking this way, and, uh, and... Sucks. <laughs> I mean, this is how we're walking now. I, I, uh... <laughs> I guess I'm not going out to recreate a Pleistocene journey. I am a 21st century explorer with, with uh, plenty of petroleum products on my back. I am not an ancient Beringian coming across the ice, but I'm still a human. I'm still a person with hands and feet. I still have that same stride. And when I get into a place, I can feel what it's like. I mean, we all can. You walk outside and you know what it's like to be human out there. We went up onto this ice sheet, scouting along the edges, scouting along the snow, looking, looking for a way up. And, and for me, I, I'm drawn to desolate landscapes, so this is paradise for me. I'm drawn to places that are just purely elemental. And you get out onto that ice sheet, you switch to skis and a sled, and you just go. You're just flying across this, this open expanse with, with these noon attacks. That's the name for the, the mountain peaks that stick up through the ice. So all these noon attacks that are completely surrounded by ice are standing out ahead of you. And you're in this open landscape where, you know, maybe we should have roped up, um, but we were also trying to understand how to make decisions, how to look at crevasses and get around them, how to, uh, how to be a human in this place, which ends up just looking like this. It ends up you sitting in your trench of snow trying to keep your, uh, your, your meal warm or during a whiteout contending with the lake at the bottom of your tent. And I just want to show you this, this video of what happens on the second day of a whiteout when you're in a three-person tent and you really can't go anywhere. Witness the lake at the bottom of the tent. The solution to the lake at the bottom of the tent. Employing his desert pothole drinking skills. <laughs> mm. That's quite a bit of water. <laughs> <laughs> but a potentially desert <laughs> What's that hair? <laughs> it's like full of sock juice and pee's been farting in the tent. It's like far there. <laughs> Things one does for entertainment and a whiteout. Extreme close up. That's <laughs> 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 all I can take. No, <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> All right. What would the 
the itch and burn tins are done. <laughs> All right, enough of that. <laughs> I, and maybe they weren't doing that in the Ice Age. But, but I, maybe they were doing something like that. Maybe they were doing something like what we were doing. I, I took some... Uh, so, some red ochre up with me. Actually, I want to, let's see if I can, oh, I, I, I gathered this, this red ochre in the Grand Canyon 15 years ago from a, from a very narrow formation, and I've been carrying it around with me for, for 15 years in my pack, and every, every several years it comes out again, and, and I thought this is the spot, so I brought it out, and I, I remember Sarah painting each of our faces. We, we mixed up water with the pigment and she just walked by painting our faces and, and I put this in because it was on the poster and I thought I might explain <laughs> what, what we were doing out there. I don't know if that explains what we were doing out there. But you go out into it. You go out and move across it. You get a sense of weather and wind when it's a wide out. You're moving with a, a GPS to, to see if you can make a straight line, which incidentally we just could not. We were, we were hooking way off and trying to imagine what it's like if you didn't have a GPS, if you didn't have a map or a compass, and you could smell in the air the, the smell of the fjords or the smell of cold air coming off the ice. If you could navigate that way, I mean, the, the human brain was 5% larger during the Pleistocene than it is now which could mean many things. I take it to mean that people were paying a lot more attention to things, that people knew how to do things we don't know how to do. I mean, what have we lost since then? What have we gained? It's 5% of our brain mass. But when you go out there, you start to remember. You start to remember what it's like to be human in the world, to be a physical animal moving across a landscape. And, and we're, we were, our, one of the goals was to get up on top of one of these noon attacks. And these things were just beautiful, just standing up out of the snow all around us. And um, this is the one we climbed up. Let's see. Yeah, there were a bunch. <laughs> and and uh, you head up the side of it, and it's the first time you've touched ground in, in several days. And you move up the saddles up toward the top, which is what I think they would have done. I think if you look at the mass of the Laurentide ice sheet, they probably didn't come across the middle of that thing. It would have been 1,800 miles of walking. They would have looked for noon attacks. They would have looked for places where the mountains were sticking up through. They would have looked for stepping stones. And as I've been doing research into this, I found that there are a number of bird species who are flying up from the south at the time, who are crossing the ice sheet and landing up in Beringia and leaving nests and eggs. And so people would have known there was a world on the other side of the ice, that birds were coming from somewhere far away and landing way up in the Arctic. So let's look back at this. How would they have gotten down? The a theory that's rising right now is that they followed the coast, that they didn't actually come inland. And so to have a look at the coast, you know, were people moving by boat? Well, they were probably using these things. They were probably using walrus skin boats. Why not? We, our brains were larger back then. Maybe we could have figured something out. And I, I traveled down to the, uh, the south central coast of Alaska, Prince William Sound. And uh, you know, after doing this ice trip of, of five pioneers heading across the ice, I wanted to then tell a real story about this is what it's like to travel as a human. You take kids with you. You take a whole bunch of kids. And you go into a place that has really big bears. And then you figure it out. And this is what your world looks like. They're wet all the time, like all the time. You see them standing out in their muck boots and the water is way over them. And they're just standing there grinning at you and you're going, no, God, stop. But then if you find a lily pad pond, they all jump in it. So you just end up following kids all over the place, exploring islands, kayaks, foot, seeing where they take you. You guys should check this out. You hit a ridge top and you look to the other side and there's a whole world past you that you can start navigating how to move between these islands, how to travel out in this place. We're different now. 
We have different kinds of maps, but I imagine that the human brain used to be the map, that, that your landscape was the actual map, and you knew every place on it. And if you didn't know it, you explored it. You looked ahead. You, you left your kids in some spot with, with flammable material. <laughs> and let them go tribal while the tides slowly rose and separated you from them. <laughs> but they had a kayak, they could figure it out, and we had important things to do. We were adults on the other side, and, and the adults had made the mistake of letting me do the food buy for, I think it was 12 days or something, and, uh, and so, you know, of course, it's the mothers who sit down and figure out that I've shortchanged all of our food. Tell me what our situation is. Well, we have enough food mm -hmm. for adults, most of the adults. <laughs> so we uh, sacrifice the children. And what we, we finally realize is that the people who needed to find their own food were the grisly old guys like me, the, the, the guys who've already reproduced, that are no longer necessary. And so we just, um, we started digging. We started looking for food all over the place. And, and, uh, and it's not a desperate situation, but you want, you want food. So, you know, at midnight in, in that light, the, the Alaskan light of midnight, the, the kids are out there digging clams and you're, you're catching fish, you're eating every, everything that you can get your hands on, except for this thing. I, we didn't eat that. But the, the kids started cooking up uh, um, all kinds of seaweed and, and, uh, and selling it to us. <laughs> and and we, had a, we had picked up a, a shrimp pot on Craigslist in Anchorage. <laughs> we got three prawns for 12 people. I... <laughs> but it's pretty exciting, you know? <laughs> You're getting a little taste of it. How, what, what do you need to do to survive out there? I mean, this isn't, like I said, it's not a survival situation, but what are you going to eat? What are you not going to eat? And, and we just changed our patterns. Every day was, was a hunting day, was, was gathering clams and, and standing around, eating them, throwing into buckets, just bullshitting to each other. This is kind of what our days were like, and I imagine something similar 10,000 years ago. Get the food and sit around and talk. Sit around and tell stories. And listen to the kids. So I think about our relationship with animals. When, uh, when you hear the old stories, it's always about the time when people were animals and animals spoke the language we could all understand. And I think those are real stories. I just don't think we were speaking in the languages we speak now that we had a different relationship with animals back then. I mean, our main concern was bears, and you know, every night we'd, we'd hang everything and we'd have a separate camp. But you know, our concern about bears and the Ice Age concern about bears was very different. Here's a comparison of a, of a grizzly, and I, I just thought it was an interesting image. <laughs> I found it on the internet. Uh, <laughs> A grizzly and a short-faced bear, and that was the dominant bear of the Americas, the short-faced bear um, that, that had you know, elongated forearms, uh, so it was obviously a running bear and just has the right grasp for, for horses and, and, uh, and young mammoths. So this is the bear you're going to be contending with. And, and uh, actually, last night I was looking at uh, bear skulls. I was with a paleontologist in Denver. Um, that's a, a short-faced bear skull. You've got to, you've got to try it. 
So that's the bear they're worried about. We're worried about a grizzly, which compared to that is a relative pet. You know, it's a, it's a small animal, but still we're out there finding like this came a upon a fresh kill, like a really fresh kill. We started seeing these, these tracks all gathered around and then found, there you can see the, the head of the deer, uh, a fawn that, that was just covered up. And when you find that, you just look around, you just um, scan your surroundings immediately, smell the air. There are large bears very close to you right now. It's an interesting feeling I think we've gotten away from that. We don't know what it's like so much to have the fear of being eaten, of being attacked by something of that size. It's good to have it now and then. It's good to look at a gut pile that's just freshly laid there and think about the grizzly bear, even though they would have been thinking about much larger things. Or if they weren't thinking about short-faced bears, it may have been this which is the American lion that was uh, all across the Americas and well up into the Arctic. And, and just because it was there, we had to do that with it. <laughs> just to put it in perspective, I think about the relationship with the animals as it was at the time. I look at the, the artwork that you see in uh, southern France and, and, uh, and Spain, the, the Pleistocene imagery, and almost all of it is animals. This is what your world would have been. Your relationships with people would have been one thing, but most of your relationships would have been with these. Uh, woolly rhinos were not in North America, so uh, it's, it's unique to, to Africa and Europe and parts of Asia to have this kind of rock art I, or cave art. I, I sometimes imagine you don't see it here in the Americas because it takes maybe 30,000 years or 50,000 years of being in the same place before you start painting in the caves. I don't know what the story is, why, why we have such different native rock art here, but the Americas are a different story, a different thing happened here. I think still they had this relationship with animals. Everything in their world was about animals. In the Ukraine there is a, a, a site where huts are made entirely out of mammoth bones. This is a plan view of the site. And here are the jaws making the footer of one of the, one of the huts. I think there are over 100 jaws in this one hut. And this is what it would have looked like. Made entirely of mammoth bones. And you put the layers back on it. You think about what that story would have looked like. In the mouth of this hut, they found a, uh, archaeologists found a, uh, uh, right there, a mammoth skull with the front of it painted, put right in the entryway. So when did, when did all this happen? Well, the oldest artifact in North America that's been found so far is a stone point that's 23,000 years old, and it came out of Chesapeake Bay on the eastern seaboard. This is the thing right here. It's dated because it, it came up with a, uh, a, a shrimp dredge that was dredging the bottom of Chesapeake Bay, and often Paleolithic artif artifacts come up with these dredges. This one happened to come up in a jumble of mastodon bones, and the chemical patina on both the bones and the stone matched. So they've been sitting together for 23,000 years, and the bones were radiocarbon dated. So that's how they got the date on this. The curious thing about this is that it doesn't look like any other points found any earlier in the Americas or any time around there. It looks more like points that are found in Spain on the Iberian Peninsula, which is a curious thing. There have been a number of these points. This is, this is a, a, a Salutrian point from, uh, from Spain. This is also a Salutrian point, and here's the one that came out of Chesapeake Bay. Now this rock came, uh, I believe it came from Virginia. It's a North American rock, so it was made here. But the story, the possible story that's emerging out of this is that some people may have come across along the edge of ice. Sea hunters may have traveled and landed right there at Chesapeake Bay, which would have been above sea level at the time. It's, it's a tricky story because there's no genetic evidence of this. My thought on it is if this happened, they probably showed up there and there wasn't enough of a population to ultimately survive. So they showed up, they left their tools, they disappeared. 
But some people are saying that humans were already in North America by then, that there are signs of people 30 and 40,000 years ago, and, the, and that debate will probably go on for the next 50 years, that the people who, if people came from Spain, they would have run into people here, who were here already. If they came from Spain or anywhere, what would it look like in Chesapeake Bay? This is the Pine Barrens in New Jersey. Last September, I took a, a trek across this place. This is a cedar bog in the Jersey Pine Barrens. And this is the same kind of landscape that would have existed at the bottom of Chesapeake Bay 23,000 years ago. So this is the kind of place where they butchered that mastodon. So this is, that's one of those things that I, I film and then I throw away, but I had to hold on to one at least. And this is, this is uh, an ecological uh, mirror of, of what it was like in the Ice Age around the DC area. And, uh, and it's, it's, a it's kind of a creepy place. I've never traveled on the East Coast. Um, and uh, <laughs> and we're, you're, you're in this, you're surrounded. Like there, there are millions of people all around you and nobody's in there. We, my friend and I walked for, for five days and saw nobody in the middle of New Jersey. Uh, of course, we were lost <laughs> most of the time. Oh, I'm confused. <laughs> I mean, my object was to go out there and get lost. What'd you just say? I don't really see how we can be where we are, but we seem to be. <laughs> and it actually it worked. Go try a trek through, uh, through the Pine Barrens, and you find noon attacks every now and then, but the noon attacks are in the form of, of uh, fire towers, and you climb up them because it's your only way to get a view. Everything is absolutely flat. Uh, you're, you're not really seeing much change. It's, just, it's beautiful, but it, it's nonstop. Forest, forest, forest. You climb up into this tower, and you look around, and this is New Jersey. This is what... This was a perfect picture of the Ice Age on the eastern seaboard. And if you looked out to the far horizon, you saw 80 miles away Manhattan sticking up above the forest. There still are isolated places, even in New Jersey. So um, get that out of the way. What about when people really started entering North America? We, we you get these little blips of people showing up here and there, but 15,000 years ago, is, the, is, is starting to look like a really solid date. This is Buttermilk Creek in Texas where you walk across this place and there are paleo points by the thousands all over the ground. It is, it is just this artifact haven and the archeologists working there are saying, you go, you go 20, 30 feet down into the ground in some places and it's more artifact than it is dirt. That it is just stone tools all over the place so I went into one of their excavations, uh, and, and here's, here's the layout. You're looking at uh, us right at the top, and then 6,000 years ago, the archaic hunters and gatherers, and below that, you're getting, you're getting into the tail end of the Ice Age, and then into the Clovis 13,000 years ago, long thought to be the, the first people to reach North America. And then you go all the way to the bottom of the pit, and you're standing at 15,000 years ago, and there are butchered mammoths and horses that are showing up in this pit at the bottom and you pick up a piece from down there that is, a, that is left over from, from tool making and you're touching an artifact, you're touching an object that somebody 15,000 years ago had manipulated. And it's like a time machine. You see back through thousands, tens of thousands of years just by holding on to this thing, just by looking into it. A nearby date to here is Paisley Caves in South Central Oregon and uh, out by Summer Lake. And I, I traveled there um, May, a couple years ago in May. And, uh, and just as I got there, the, the caves are, there are caves all along this front here. And just as I got there and set up my camp, this, this rainbow came down and, and touched the point, five mile point where the, where the caves, caves are. This is, just to give you a reference, Summer Lake is right there. And this has, in these caves, a piece of human feces came out that dates to 14,400 years. 
So it's a, it's a solid paleo point to put in the map. And you look into this cave and, and you climb back in there and just look back out at what used to be an ice age lake. And you can see the view they saw. You put that lake back in, you bring the mammoths back in, you put some ponderosas around, but things have changed. The lake has gone. And you walk out along the ancient shorelines and you find signs of people all over the place. This is a, both the tool that caused the flaking and the flaking itself of obsidian. They were all sitting in one spot on the ground. They'd been kind of scattered by erosion, but somebody had sat with this stone and flaked off pieces of the obsidian. And, and as you walk along these old shorelines, these are not paleo points. These are more modern as in 2,000 years old. Um, you find signs of little encampments, places where, where an obsidian arrowhead will just be, be sitting there on the ground. And all these things are time machines. All these things are ways of going back. So where were people back then, 15,000 years ago? Probably the, the largest concentration was in Florida, curiously. That was, uh, Florida was about twice the size at the time. It, uh, sea levels were down. You had much more land showing. And I traveled out there. Uh, I actually hooked up with these two guys. Uh, always go with people who look like that. <laughs> they will make your trip exciting. They were act they were... They were on their honeymoon on a 30-day river trip, jumping rivers all across Florida, and I hooked up with them for about 10 days up in the panhandle south of Tallahassee, and we, we took a, a canoe and, and I took a kayak out on these, these rivers. And these rivers, uh, I've talked to, to paleontologists who've gone out and, and they could see mammoth skeletons in the bottoms of the rivers, that there are just bones everywhere out there. I didn't see any, I looked all over the place, but this place was, has the highest concentration of dire wolves and saber-toothed cats in the Americas. That this was, this was a dangerous Eden back then. And you get on these rivers and they just, they, sometimes you can't find where a river starts or ends, where you can't find its banks. There, there was one place, the Osceola River, just went into a hole. And it was a big river. It was like 40 feet across. It just went into a hole and was gone. And you walk a quarter mile and there's another hole and it comes back out. And you put in there and keep moving. And, uh, um, and this landscape really has not changed much since the Ice Age. It's, it's, a, it's a little warmer. It's, it's a little wetter. But it's a similar place. The same rivers are flowing across it as were flowing then. And there are, um, the really nice thing about it is it has alligators, which I'm not used to alligators. And it has low, low-hanging things. Um, but there are just alligators spilling into the river in front of you and, and swimming underneath your kayak and disappearing. And, but more so than the alligators, um, um, well, these guys, they're, the turtles just drop into the river as you're going. You just, it's just plunk, 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 plunk of <laughs> turtles falling off of limbs. But it's the snakes. The snakes are what I had the most difficult time with because they, they hang in the, in the trees. <laughs> and I wasn't used to that. You're passing under things. And I, I don't know the snakes really well. This, I, I got to a, a, a wide spot in the river and, and, uh, and stowed my paddle and I just floated for a little while and I had a flute with me and I played the flute and was having a magical moment and, and I kind of I glanced over and I saw that I was about to hit a log and so I just I thought okay I'll just hit it and slide off of it and I stashed my, my flute and I looked over at the log and there's this snake that's at about shoulder height and I was about three feet away from it when I saw it. And, you know, I couldn't grab the paddle or I couldn't move at all. And I don't know snakes really well, but this one, um, it looks like a venomous snake. And I swear to God, if that thing had bit me, I would have died like right there, just like that. I, I was just I was just going, no, please, please, please don't. Because the snake heads, the venomous snake has the, has the round jaw. Of, but this is the exception. That is the brown water snake. Um, it's not venomous, but I would have died anyway had it bit me. <laughs> and you're, you're traveling the, the, the backwaters and they're, they're, uh, 
you, you talk to people back there, at least me, I couldn't understand a damn word they were saying. <laughs> I, I would, we'd be saying, we need to get out, we're trying to get to this, this river and that, and how do you get there? And they go, well, you just go on there yonder and take a look at it, and they're just, I, I don't know what they're saying. I, I, you go there yonder and you take a what? And, and uh, it, was, it was a different world, but everybody was remarkably helpful, and, but it is creepy when you're coming by and seeing these alligator skulls hanging off and you think maybe I should just keep going. <laughs> and you find these, these, uh, these springs, these deep blue holes and you, you jump into them and swim and they, and they look bottomless. And I've been talking to archeologists who've been going down into these places, who've been uh, going down in, uh, with, with uh, compressors and, and, uh, and one guy that I was talking to said, you drop down and just, it just goes completely black when you get inside. And you're just lowering to the bottom, and you stir up sediment, and you have you have this uh, incredibly powerful light, and you can't even see it. So you have to stand there for about half an hour and let the sediment sediment drop. And he said, when your light finds something like a mammoth tusk down at the bottom of the river, he said it's like seeing gold because it reflects the light, and it just glows down at the bottom of these holes. And these holes are just there, there are skeletons of, of American lions, saber tooths, uh, uh, sloths. They, these are repositories for the Ice Age where you can look at the skeletons that are there and you can piece back together this world that doesn't look that different. Although Florida is a lot smaller now. But we followed the rivers out that archaeologists have been following, that they've been mapping the, the gulf and finding the pathways of rivers under 300 feet of water where rivers used to travel, leaving their marks. And at the confluences of these rivers, they see stones in circles, which means people were camping there at the confluences of rivers that are now over 100 feet underwater. So where we are here, we're paddling out to the Gulf, out from there. So we're hitting the Gulf, where back then you would have been still another 100 miles inland. And you get out there and you see what Florida looked like at the time. Out on these big open plains, it was, it was, a, it was more of a savanna-like landscape. So you're paddling over what had been savanna. And the tide is going out on you and you're getting kind of screwed because you're, you're in these channels that are getting shallower and shallower. And you just have to go find a place to camp to pull off. And, and uh, it turns out that the sea level there is, is above ground everywhere at high tide. So you just, you just mash down a little spot, drag in your canoe, set a camp, and feel the water come up around your feet. And crabs are crawling across your feet as you're cooking dinner. And all night long you feel the water coming up under your tent and you keep waking up and testing it and it's not coming in and taking you away yet. And in the morning you wake up and the tide has gone back out and you paddle through these sloughs, seeing a Pleistocene world. This is what it would have looked like across most of, of what is the Gulf Coast of Florida. You would have had these, except put mammoths in there. <laughs> put African-sized lions. Put giant land sloths. So that's, that's probably 15,000 years ago. And I'm going to take this up to uh, 13,000 which is Clovis. And that's when you start seeing this unique form of, of fluted tools. And, and fluted tools are found, it, was, it has been thought for a long time that Clovis came from Siberia and came down through here. And, but it's starting to look like the Clovis started over here and spread out. That this was kind of the center of Paleolithic, Paleolithic world was Florida, the Eastern Seaboard, Tennessee, and all that was moving this way. And the Clovis points that you find, the fluted points you find up in Alaska, probably came from the south and went up. There's more and more evidence that people were migrating this way back to Siberia. So the, the, it's not just one story. It's not just going one direction. So to, to close this out, I want to take you to, to Utah where I was looking at Clovis material and, and the last of the mammoths, the mammoths probably died out about 11,000 years ago in the lower 48. I, I went out with a friend of mine, a, a pilot last, uh, um, last October, 
And uh, we flew out of western Colorado, out toward the desert, where mammoth bones have been found, and Clovis points have been found. And this is not a landscape that you automatically think about mammoths in, but these canyons, some of the alcoves have, have mammoth dung six feet deep, where mammoths have been up in these, doing who knows what, up in these alcoves. And so we're flying out there in a, uh, in a, a, a plane that I think is from the late 1940s. Uh, it's a cloth wing Cessna. Um, and and uh, Neil, the pilot, is, is the mayor of the small town where I live, and he has 200 hours of flying experience, which isn't very much. And we would land at, uh, at some of the small airstrips, and, and other pilots would come over and look at our plane and go, wow, that's some real flying. You guys must be serious pilots. And I'm just thinking, oh, God, we're going to die, because what we're doing here is we're flying out to... Uh, 1950s uranium prospector landing strips that are out in the desert. And we have a little map with us to try to find these. <laughs> and when you find them, you have to fly around them a lot because this, this as, we were, as we were approaching this, this one strip, which turned out to be very difficult for him to land, uh, he, he, was, he was making one pass, and I said, what are you looking for? And he said, anthills. Because if you hit an anthill, it'll flip your plane. Because this is a very light plane. And I'm, and I'm just going, oh my god, what? You didn't tell me this. And, and, uh, and we came, we actually tried this, this airstrip uh, four times before we finally landed. And, I just, and that's four times of boom, 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 and then back up in the air and then swing back around and try it again. And it's, uh, you know, it was nerve wracking. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and Neil had a broken wrist and, and it, it, was, it was complex, but you know, we, we figured it out. But this is, uh, this is as we were just taking off after a failed landing. He asked me not to film the landings. <laughs> it made him nervous, but you can get a sense of where we are that these canyons are just dropping off to the sides. And this is where mammoth remains have been found, down inside of these canyons. During the Pleistocene, this would have been paradise. These springs would have been running like mad because there would have been heavy snowpacks and some glaciers up in these mountains that are recharging the aquifers. And this place would have been lush with canyon grapes and, and forests, riparian forests down in the bottom. Now it's desert. And we landed out there, staked down the plane, and would take our packs and just head off and just check out this place. Come back in the morning, fire up coffee, get the plane going, and head back out to the next spot, looking down at the shapes underneath us, looking down at the signs that are left behind, the signs of us here now at a, at a potash evaporation pond, signs of erosion along the Colorado River that has been going on for millions of years. This is the, the confluence of the Green River and the Colorado in, in, the, in the heart of Canyonlands National Park. And when you fly in uh, closer, you can see the two rivers coming together right there. Clovis points were found all throughout this region. There were hunters, spear hunters, during the Ice Age occupying this desert landscape where we'd get out and walk around and look under alcoves and you'd see a cliff dwelling back under an alcove. And I used to, I used to study the cliff dwellers and that's maybe a thousand years ago. And at this point, I look at that and go, ah, that was yesterday. I mean, that's, that's almost now a thousand years ago. Your sense of time really changes when you're out in these places when you're landing your plane and wandering up into caves looking for shelter in the rain, looking for places to sit out the weather. And when the weather clears, you get back up and you fly over this immense desert. And right here is a Clovis site. Let's see if I've... And we're flying over the San Juan River. This is, if you know Southeast Utah, this is Comb Ridge where the highway comes through to the town of Bluff. And, uh, and there's the San Juan in the distance. So we're coming into land at Bluff, or land at the Bluff airstrip, and um, 
the interest there is a rock art panel that was recently found. And I've got a, let's see, there's an arrow here showing where the rock art is. And it appears to be mammoth rock art. Um, and there's a lot of debate about this right now. We landed and hooked up with a, uh, uh, a rock art researcher in the town of Bluff and he took us out to this site and you're looking up at this cliff wall that has has images, uh, it actually has hundreds of images pecked into it. You see these faces looking back down at you from, you know, this is probably about uh, uh, 1200 years old and then right next to it is this older panel which if you look at it straight on looks like a mammoth and possibly uh, uh, bison antiquus, the, the Ice Age bison. And uh, I, I don't know if it is or not. It might just be a coincidence of lines. There are a few other mammoth looking images nearby, but man, this town has gotten really excited about it. And they took the driftwood that they found <laughs> along the river and they made this mammoth. And then in this ritual, on winter solstice. They burned it to the ground. And I think about that. I think about mammoth hunts. I mean, Oregon, uh, or Washington actually has a, uh, a uh, butchered mammoth with a, sp with a spear point still embedded behind the shoulder blade. Mammoths have been found all across North America, butchered. And in fact, North America has more mammoth butchers than any place else in the world. Um, something else was going on here. You look back to Clovis times 13,000 years ago and people were making enormous weapons. I've seen some of the, the large Clovis tools and they, you have to carry them around in two hands. They were, they were big. They were different than, than anything that had been seen before and mammoths were going down left and right. That may be one of the reasons for the extinction of the mammoths is that something happened then and you're seeing a lot of changes in the climate and there was a comet impact 13,100 years ago. A lot was going on back then and I sometimes look at these tools and think, oh, humans were making giant tools because the world was getting bigger than them. This flood, the big flood that left all the sediments here from uh, ancestral length Missoula, that happened in Clovis time. They would have watched it. People standing on top of high buttes would have seen that flood spread around them. They were living at a time of dramatic climate change when sea levels were visibly coming up. Within your lifetime, you were watching them come up. Their world was changing radically. And I think maybe humans, their, our reaction to it was to say, kill the big things. Make yourself large. Make yourself impenetrable. But inevitably, it didn't work. It held on for a while, but the Ice Age was ending and tools got smaller and smaller and smaller. Eventually we adapted. And I look at these stories, I look back at that time and I think, we're in one of those times now. We're making weapons that are too big, that, that, that cause destruction that, that doesn't work. We are, we are making ourselves enormous. We are building skyscrapers. We are building the largest things we've ever built in history. And we're building them all over the place. What's going on right now? You start thinking about this in 10,000 year increments. You start thinking about an ancient clock that's being buried in the desert. Where will it be 10,000 years from now? Who will be here? Because it will happen. We will get there. I study the Ice Age so that I can understand the bigger picture, so I can understand where we are, that we aren't alone. This isn't the peak. This isn't the end. This is just a moment. And everything we do right now matters. Thank you for coming and listening tonight. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have a little bit of time for questions. Um, and uh, so if, if you do have any questions, I could attempt to answer them, yes. Um, the Kalapuya that lived here in the valley, uh, apparently been here for a long time, have a, a, a story of a sudden flood 
that came up and chased the animals and the people to the top of Mary's Peak, which is yeah, yeah, and uh, and then uh, the, the fun comes up and uh, one of the characters throws back something that made the water angry, and the water goes away instantly. So really. Huh. A reverberation, maybe, of some distant memory, perhaps, of the museum. But yeah, I it think. Might be possible that, you know, a, a story like that. I think it's more than possible. I think if you look at the, the, the lifespan of oral traditions, that thing, there, there's no way we wouldn't be talking about it. That, that humans would not talk about something that happened at, the, at that time frame that was that big. That story would last through. I mean, the, the Noah's Ark story is the same thing. Uh, you know, it, it's theorized that, that it was during the, uh, the release of, uh, of uh, Lake Agassiz, which was held back be much larger than Lake Missoula, but it drained out of uh, Hudson Bay and caused a sea level rise, which tipped over uh, out of the Mediterranean. Uh, and, and you can imagine a bunch of pastoralists in sandals going, ah, build an ark, here comes some water, and, and then tell a story about it for the next, the next 8,000 years. Yeah. I'm wondering how, in your different uh, travels, how this has affected you on a daily basis in terms of how you've chosen to live your life and the choices you make based on the studies and the experiences that you've seen. It's, it's, it's very hard for me to pick that out because this is kind of, this is what I do all the time. Um, so it's, my life and it are the, are, the are the same thing. Um, it, I mean, in a way, like I start writing about people leaving the known into the unknown, and immediately we've moved out of the house that we lived in for 15 years unexpectedly. Like we just go. That's what, that's what happened. My life, whatever I'm writing about happens in my life. So, so now I'm, I'm, I'm living transient, moving from house to house with my family, and, uh, and we, are, we are recreating some kind of migration. Pardon me? And you're raising your children out of your past, the wisdom that you've accumulated over the years. By, your by trying not to pass very much. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't talk to them about, I mean, they get it. They hear what I'm doing. I don't tell them, I don't talk to them about what I'm doing other than. So your consciousness would be an important thing to have them be really totally aware. Of where they are. I just take them out and I go, here, figure it out. Let's go. Let's, let's enjoy this. Let's have a good time. I don't really talk to them about, I mean, we'll have conversations, but I won't say, this is how it works. Listen to me. This is how that, because I shouldn't be saying that. Um, so I just hope that they're getting it from being, from us traveling and journeying. Yeah. And I'd like to go back really briefly to, the, to your question about the, the stories. I just was talking to a Clinket woman uh, two days ago uh, about, about different creation stories and, and how they relate to scientific stories. Uh, so I'm looking at the empirical mythology and the uh, traditional mythology, and, and she said there is a story about Raven used to be white, and then something happened and Raven turned black. And the story is long and elaborate, but she was saying what happened is that the white birds were up on the ice. And then when the ice left, the white birds left with it. The black birds moved up into that landscape. So she's saying our story is about the retreating of the ice and the raven following that retreat and the white bird turns into the black bird. I think that, I think that the scientific stories and the native stories, you can often put them right in front of each other and, and you can see through them and see each other. They, they often tell the same story. They're, yeah? Um, I was curious about how you talk about when people came across the Bering Strait, they, they stopped and they lived there for 15,000 years. And, and so are there people who actually are nomadic or who migrate and actually move much faster than that? And then there's some who move very slowly. And how do you tell yeah. them? Because you don't see the ones who move fast. You, you just imagine that they're there. You can't see them. There's so little left from the Pleistocene. You really have to sit in the same place for a long time to leave enough artifacts for something to show up. And so if anybody was moving fast, they're invisible. And I think there are plenty of people. I think people were coming into the Americas way back. But, and I'm talking 60,000 years. I mean, I, I don't know. I, but just, you know, imagine it. That, that small groups are coming out, but you can't, moving a people is different than some people moving. Yeah. 
to move a whole people, you've got to have children and you've got to have relationships, traditions. If you don't have traditions, if you don't have ancestors and all that, you're going to get somewhere and just, and just disappear. You're not going to last. And so I bet there were a lot of those people who just disappeared. And they were the fast movers. They were probably like me. Like my generations, how long will my family be known in North America? Like, I don't know, we're, we're fast movers. We just got here. We just showed up in the last few hundred years and, and you know, we've left a lot of stuff, but if this was the ice age, we wouldn't be detected. We would just be going, okay, where's the next place? Let's keep going, let's keep going. And we wouldn't be leaving artifacts behind, but I think they were there. I think the people who stayed for 15,000 years were, the land bridge was a, a great place to be. It was ice free. The summers were slightly warmer than they are now. So it's, it, was, it was a paradise. Uh, drill cores taken from the bottom of the Bering Sea from the, the surface of the, of the uh, former land bridge have come up with flower pollen that is, the, the amounts are in, incomparable to, to the... Why shouldn't they bother to go? To yeah, why would you, you? You're in paradise there and you're somewhat isolated. You're way up in the north. You're in this little paradise. And I look at that and I see this as one of the creation stories. I look at the, the Pueblo creation stories of, of coming out of the underworld, of the last world, through a small hole and emerging onto this world. And I look at the Bering Land Bridge and I go, there's your hole. You know, there's your, there's your bottleneck to get you down into the rest of the Americas. That's the story being told in a different way. Yeah? What's your view on where the folks that were in the Florida area that you feel may have migrated west and north, where did they come from? That's, that's a really good question. The uh, Very little uh, genome sequencing has been done because remains just don't last. Uh, one sequence just came out of uh, eastern Montana that is a 13,000-year-old individual whose genes are connected both to Native America and to Eurasia. So you can, at least through that one individual, you can see somebody coming across the land bridge or down the coast and that, that, for me, that's the viable route. They came that way and moved across the continent and, and ended up in Florida. But South America is a whole different story. There was more going on in South America than was going on up here. What was happening in the Paleolithic in South America makes this continent look like the backwaters. I mean, South America has greater li linguistic diversity than any place else in the world, which suggests people were coming from all over. There are some paleontologists who I'm talking to who are saying Africans were definitely landing in South America, just whipping off the tail of a typhoon two days across, and, and boom, you're in South America. The early dates are showing up all over the place. 22,000-year-old date just came out of Brazil. Um, there's a possible 30,000-year-old date on the coast of Chile. So this could have, it could have been movement up from South America coming from Polynesia. Uh, there are no genes to indicate it. Uh, the overall theory is that they came from Siberia, but that's what we say in North America. <laughs> are there, yeah. Of all the places you've traveled, where did you find the insects to be the worst? <laughs> you have to amaze about how early humans actually dealt with that. Yeah, that's a good question. Well, uh, the Arctic was definitely uh, Arctic mosquitoes. I was out for 50 days on the Yukon, and it was a really bad year. And, uh, and you'd get to a village, and nobody would be outside, and you knew. <laughs> it was, and we were out for 50 days, just out in it, and the mosquitoes were just, uh, <laughs> I've been ruined for life. I used to be able to sleep outside with mosquitoes, and now it just takes one, and I go, ah! So the mosquitoes were worse there, although Florida, the chiggers, I don't know chiggers. I'm not from Chiggerland, and I didn't know what was happening to me, <laughs> but it was awful. It was almost, it was worse than the mosquitoes, uh, because the, I mean, it's a different quality of worse. The mosquitoes are just driving you nuts. The chiggers, you don't know they're there until all of a sudden you're going, ah, what happened? And then you've got like 300 bites, welts all over your legs. It's, it's terrible. So, yeah, um, Florida and the Arctic are the two worst places. <laughs> early, early humans, any, any ideas about how? I think they'd put up with it. <laughs> I think we're soft. <laughs> I think the things that we complain about now, if we complained about, some paleo, about it to some Paleolithic badass, 
They just be going, you, you're bothered by mosquitoes? Are you serious? I think they were thinking about American lions. And, um, but, but it's a good question. It's something that I should, uh, I, I should look into that. How about one more, one more question? Yeah. I understand that the first sign of the vision uh, reaching Australia is fires. Hmm. That's now. I'm still. I'm still in the researching. I'll. I'll I know about the Florida burning, and that was back to well. I think forty-eight thousand years ago is the accepted uh, early early Australia arrival. Um, but I, I'll have to, I'll have to look. I, I haven't, I haven't come across anything yet. Um, but we definitely burn, humans burn things. So, I mean, we're still doing it. Uh, it's, it's, it's a, a human thing to be doing. So I'm sure it would, if, if it's out there, it'll show up in the record. Well, thank you so much for, for coming and listening to me. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Grassroots Books and Music, our favorite independent bookstore, is out in the lobby. Uh, Craig's books are every bit as entertaining as he is in person. So, And he'll come out and sign them for you. Thanks again, everybody. Good night.